sisters and brothers in the Dhamma, Namo Buddhaya Jai Bhim. There was only one way out. Religious societies, organizations, and groups, far from being a help to spiritual development, were only a hindrance. However lofty the ideals with which they were founded, they had a natural tendency to degenerate in the hands of selfish human beings into instruments for the acquisition of money, position, power, and fame. Instead of trying any longer to work with them, we would follow the example of the Buddha and sever at one stroke our connection with an incorrigible world. We would renounce the household life and go forth into the life of homelessness as wanderers in search of truth. For the last few months, we had only sat hesitantly on the shore of the vast ocean of spiritual life. Now, casting aside all fear, we would plunge boldly in. Having made this resolution, we lost no time putting it into effect. With the help of a handful of Geru Amati, the reddish-brown earth used since time immemorial by Indian ascetics, we dyed our shirts and sarongs the traditional saffron of the world renunciant. Suitcases and watches were sold, trousers, jackets and shoes given away, identification papers destroyed. Apart from the robes which we were to wear, we kept only a blanket each and our books and notebooks. As for the last three months, hair and beard had been allowed to grow, we did not need shaving tackle. Tibetan Buddhists believe that the appearance of a rainbow is one of the most auspicious signs and the biographies of their saints and yogis are replete with references to this phenomenon. Whether our going forth on the 18th of August 1947 may be considered an auspicious event, I cannot say, but it was certainly signaled by the appearance of rainbows. As we left Kasoli, it was raining but as in the course of our descent, we emerged from the clouds into the bright sunshine below. We saw arching the road at intervals of a few dozen yards, not only single, but double and triple rainbows waiting for us. We passed through them as though through the multicolored arcades of some celestial palace. Against the background of bright sunshine, jewel-like glittering raindrops, and hills of the freshest and most vivid green, this plethora of delicate seven-hued bows seemed like the epiphany of another world. So this, of course, is Banti writing about his going forth on the 18th of August, 1947, and I have the great honour of publicly reflecting upon that. And I must say at once, I'm rather daunted uh, by the task. Uh, I usually don't script talks these days, but I've really scripted this one because I'm so daunted. I'm daunted because of the theme itself, going forth, renunciation. Uh, and I feel so deficient in that, so lacking in that, especially as I contemplate my expanding waistline. Sometimes I've even thought that going, it's going forth that is the shadow of Buddhism. It's so easy to ignore going forth, renunciation, pass over it. And yet, there is the Buddha, the founder of our tradition, who went forth in the fullest way imaginable. We have to relate to going forth in one way or another. And of course, Bhante followed in the Buddha's footsteps and I would say his life is characterized by continuous going forth. He never stopped being one step, one step beyond the given, as he once says, said. I might be deficient in going forth, but I can at least revere my teachers going forth. I can track that rainbow path. In one of his late writings, Reflecting on his going forth, Bhante said, the rainbow 
became for me a symbol of the spiritual path, the track of which I have followed in one way or another all my life. So I will attempt to trace that track, glimpses of that elusive track, rainbows after all are beautiful but elusive. Inevitably, my tracings will be subjective. These are some of the things I have noticed that attract me, that appeal to me. So before going further, just one observation. As far as I know, Banti commemorated his going forth far more than any other event in his individual spiritual life. Yes, he certainly reflected and wrote about his bhikkhu ordination and all of the ordinations and initiations he received. And of course, he commemorated and celebrated the founding of the order and the movement. We used to have very big festivals for those days. But he did commemorate his going forth in at least two lectures, one of them given here on an order convention in 1997 and again in 2007 at Padmaloka. And it's interesting to reflect that his going forth involved no formal ordination. It was him and his friend, Satya Priya, who entered into that homeless, wandering life, a life of no possessions, no civil status, a life of no worldly certainty whatsoever, a life outside of any given and established tradition. His going forth was an entry into a life lived outside of conventional society and its values. His going forth is perhaps unimaginable to us in our highly regulated and comfortable world. His going forth is the foundation of his spiritual life, and it's right that we should celebrate it and reflect upon it and learn from it. So the first thing I want to reflect upon is going for refuge and inspiration. Bhante goes forth out of inspiration, and something else as well, which I'll mention a bit later. I recalled in reflecting on this talk, on giving this talk, how often my own presentations on going forth and renunciation related themes were always rather strained, even a bit heavy, because they lacked genuine inspiration, because actually I wasn't doing going forth. I might go on about what to give up and all that, but it was theory, it was even moralistic. Bhante went forth because he was inspired to go forth. If you look at his poetry from that period, the poetry of the early 50s, there's just tremendous inspiration and profound love of the Dharma. He called himself at that time Dharma Priya, lover of the Dharma. He even described his early spiritual life as a love affair. And here on that convention in 1997, he spoke about the Arya Pariyasana, the Buddha's noble quest. He reflected on the meaning of the word asana, desire, desiring, longing. The Arya Pariyasana was a desiring, a longing for the transcendental, coming out of a love of the transcendental. He spoke of Dharma Chanda which he said needs to be very strong indeed. He said, we have this word philosophy, love of wisdom, but love is far too weak. He said, it's more like a craze for wisdom, a mania for wisdom, something very, very strong, even a sort of frenzy taking you over. But this is quite different, he said, very interesting comment. It's not about having an idea of the Arya Pariyasana, and trying to grasp that idea, that's literalism. Very interesting definition of literalism. He said it comes rather, this longing, this desire, this movement out of a deep contemplation of the Arya Pariyasana, being profoundly moved by that, profoundly inspired by that. And inspiration is an important theme in Bhante's teaching for very obvious reasons. I remember, I think it was Marlini giving a talk on inspiration on an early, the first 
Order Convention I uh, attended. And Bunty introduced these talks for, for the Order members who in these little symposia. And uh, I think before Marlene's talk, he said, uh, what do you need for a good talk, to give a good Dharma talk? Three things, inspiration, inspiration, inspiration. There's that amazing description of the second dhyana in a method of personal development. I really think that's worth contemplating, where he's talking about inspiration, that deep, if you like, mystical state, not a language he would use, where the inspiration is either descending or ascending. He talks about nagas and darkanis. And in relation to the darkani, this is Bhante commenting on Milarepa's criticism of indulging in empty speeches, rather pertinent for somebody like myself. Bounty says, the danger lies in airing one's knowledge, especially knowledge that is not based on personal experience in order to impress. It is the tendency to pronounce your opinions and views on the Dharma, but not for the sake of whoever might be listening, but simply to hear your own voice authoritatively holding forth. The danger is not just vanity, but misusing the Dharma. If you are airing your own views rather than making it clear what the Dharma has to say, your communication is just an empty noise, however impressive your command of rhetoric. That is to say your darkani will desert you. The darkani, remember, is the third tantric refuge representing spiritual inspiration as it becomes available to you. When you are in touch with the darkanis, you will find forces of inspiration welling up within you. But of course, what can well up can also dry up. Let yourself become arrogant or glib, and the forces of inspiration will slip away. You will be so busy listening to the sound of your own voice that you won't be able to hear the voice of the darkani within. The darkanis are very easily disturbed. And to stay in contact with them, you have to listen very carefully. Theirs is a subtle and refined form of energy. And you can't take it for granted. In other words, you need to know where your inspiration comes from and make sure that you keep the channels to that source open. And then, when Milarepa speaks of the teaching of the whispered lineage, is the darkanis breath. Bunty again. The darkanis represent untrammeled energies whose natural medium is the openness of reality. And their breath is inspiration. The darkanis breath is the inspiration of inspiration itself. It comes straight out of the open space of reality itself from the enlightened mind, straight from the enlightened mind. And then this, if you can't feel the darkening's breath on your shoulder, whatever you do, spiritually speaking, is just hypocritical posturing. So a good motto to carry with you through your spiritual life is, don't forget the breath of the darkening's. Very striking words, I think you'll agree, uh, which we perhaps need to reflect on a lot. So without this inspiration, without the breath of the darkani, we can sink back into worldliness. Spiritual communities can so easily become worldly religious groups. The darkani, after all, is dangerous. She dwells outside of structures. She is anti-structure a theme I'll return to later. But my next theme, going forth and disillusionment. So in the passage at the beginning, Bhante and Satyapriya are profoundly disillusioned by the religious groups they had been around. This theme recurs throughout Bhante's life, disillusionment with religious groups, even with Buddhist groups, even at times feeling let down and betrayed. Disillusionment is not, as he said in a late seminar, a later seminar, it's not disgruntlement, it's not a resentful state, it's a seeing through. A seeing through 
of worldly life, seeing through worldly life, leading to a profound turning away, turning around. And this is the, a recurrent theme in Bunty's life. In the Rainbow Road, before he goes forth, he describes his experience of the expat hill station dance in Darjeeling. As I sat at one side of the ballroom with four or five gaily dressed women, partners were scarce, watching my cousin Audrey spin past with one uniformed American after another and a thin, very much dyed and painted woman of 55 vigorously doing a sort of rumba with another, I was suddenly seized by an overpowering sense of unreality as I had sometimes experienced in England. The dancers became ghosts, the ballroom vanished, the music faded into the distance, and I was left alone in a great void with a strong feeling of disgust and revulsion. And listen to this from extracts from old diary leaves from the early 50s. This is the entry for July the 19th, 1953. Many strange dreams during the night. In one of them, a goddess spoke about my past and future life. Felt a complete lack of interest in anything. As the evening drew on, my mood deepened. When I went out, I experienced deeply the unreality of all things. People seemed like ghosts and shadows. My body seemed to float along the road. Was half out of my normal consciousness. The mind was poised, steady, and without desires, though not very clear. It's important to note, though, that Bhante's sense of the illusory nature of life, its unreality, and even that sense of disgust, it's not misanthropy. Around these two extracts are vivid descriptions of the world around him, the authenticity of the hill people, of the Nepalese and the Tibetans, his joy at his cat, Cleopatra, giving her birth to her kittens, dressing the wound of a child uh, from the of the local people, his various communications. This period, or, or another period in Kalimpong, also, he also describes a period of profound engagement with the Lankavatara Sutra, which is, of course, concerned with, among other things, the parav paravritti, the turning around in the deepest seat of consciousness, the revolution in the basis, the realization of the illusory nature of life and of perception only, he was reading, particularly D.T. Suzuki's studies in the Lankavatara Sutra. And I had a look at these, trying to, trying to experience what Bhante experienced. Uh, no way. I mean, you know, I had a go. Um, but Bhante hints at his deep contemplative reading of this sutra, which he said was almost as important to him as the Diamond Sutra and the Sutra of Hui Neng. He hints at the deep meditations arising from this study, from this reading, of being profoundly inward, of wanting to remain in that inward state, but then having to go to Sikkim to give lectures, yet somehow remaining as well in that deeply meditative mood. And that theme of seeing through, of the illusory nature, recurs in the West. Uh, especially the unreality of words. For a considerable period prior to 1970, I had been overwhelmed by a feeling that words had no meaning whatever. It was not that they were imprecise or clumsy or inept to express ex eternal verities, but quite literally they were divide, devoid of any meaning. Besides making the writing of letters virtually impossible, this feeling made it difficult for me to even speak. When asked a question about, for example, Buddhism, I would see quite clearly that the question was utterly meaningless, that in reality, nothing had been asked at all, and that all that had happened was that, activated by certain psychological conditionings, someone had produced a series of completely meaningless sounds. Intrigued by this passage, because I knew Bounty was 
teaching during that time, I, I, many years later, I asked Bhante whether he had still managed to respond to people. He said, yes, of course. I communicated with them. That sense of meaninglessness of their words was there, but he had to con con continue to communicate with people and respond to their needs and their concerns. I got the impression he was sort of inhabiting two realms at once. And no wonder in that Bodhisattva ideal series, he would describe the Bodhisattva as a living contradiction. So this brings me to my third theme, going forth and otherness. I remember when The Thousand Petaled Lotus was published. That was the first version of The Rainbow Road. I was living in Brighton. I was 17 or 18, living with Buddha Dazra. I, I suppose in my own fumbling way, I'd gone forth from home, left mum and dad, certainly, uh, to live with Buddha Dasa and others in Brighton. I really love reading The Thousand Petaled Lotus, not least for its vivid descriptions of India, of the people, the natural world, and his description of these different adventures and so on. Uh, but I must admit, the thing that really, a real giveaway, the thing that really, I really took to was his descriptions of food. <laughs> I mean, the food just sounded so tasty. And the way he describes Guru Masala Dosa in his memoirs being, oh, goodness me, rice and curries and, oh, I just wanted to eat that food. I mean, there was only the not very good Indian restaurant across the road where I spent a lot of time just trying to, you know, be in that world. Um, so, you know, not so much a response to Bhante's going forth, but <laughs> the culinary delights of India. But the writing is so vivid and so beautiful. The other is very vivid. People, places, things, sense experience, a very sensual writing. People are especially vivid. I'll just give you two brief examples that just came into my mind. Uh, the first is a description of the tantric Yalahanka Swami. Having advanced a few steps into the room, the Swami paused. His sturdy, saffron-clad figure lit up by the rich yellow glow of the oil lamps. With a shock of surprise, I saw that he had only one eye. And though it was not situated in the center of his forehead, it gave his features already grim and terrible enough, so startlingly villainous a cast, that they seemed more appropriate to some notorious highwayman or pirate of the old days than to a celebrated ascetic. At the same time, and all this I registered instantaneously, Yalahanka Swami had an expression of compassion I had seen on no other face. And this as he explored the communities around Arunachala and Ramana Maharshi's ashram. Inside was a single small room, completely bare, and inside the room, almost directly facing us, there sat meditating the most beautiful young man I had ever seen. Slim and fair complexioned, he sat there with closed eyes, beautiful, not only on account of his perfectly proportioned body, naked, save for a small cloth, but even more so on account of the beatific smile that irradiated his face. He was quite oblivious to our presence. Unable to take our eyes off him, we stood there for several minutes. Then, having closed the door behind us even more gently than we had opened it, we slowly made our way back to the ashram. Bhante, of course, is not in these worlds, in the world of India as a tourist, as an orientalist, as an anthropologist, as a colonial. His immersion is total with nothing to fall back on except the dharma. Even with others, though, he is profoundly alone. He is keenly aware of the world of India that he's in. He participates in it. At the same time, he seems 
profoundly alone. He's a Buddhist in the midst of Hindu society, even finding the Buddhist teachers he met lacking when compared with some of the Hindu teachers he met. And even with his friend Satchapriya, he is alone as Satchapriya battles with his own Hindu conditioning, sometimes taking that out on Bhante. If you want, by the way, to see the origins of our private ordination, it's in these experiences of Bhante in, in India, in South India. Traditional Buddhist teachers dwell on this the, or dwell on this. They will urge us uh, to go alone into another world. Padmasambhava says, all those close to us are obstacles. So do not remain in the land of your father. And when you leave, go alone. I must say, I certainly found leaving the land of my father to live in, in, 19, live in India in 1978, although I didn't go alone, was probably the strongest dose of enforced renunciation I have ever experienced. I went with Lokomitra when he started things in Pune, or rather, I tagged along, uh, desperately trying to keep up with you know, Lokomitra's orange whirlwind. He was an Anagarika, very hard to keep up. I wasn't there as a tourist. I was there immersed in a Buddhist community. And it was extremely difficult for me because it was so unbelievably other. But that period, and then later in the 1980s and 1990s, I would say have had a profound influence upon me. I sometimes wonder if my short, compared with some people's stays in India, have had the, one, some, the, probably the, the single most biggest effect on me, apart, of course, from meeting Bhante. I learned so much about life about such things as devotion, hospitality, and gratitude from our Indian brothers and sisters. I learned so much about the socially transformative power of the Dharma and of even living the Dharma life in the face of almost constant oppressive threat. You know, I'll never forget the day our regular class in the centre of Pune, people were coming in after some terrible violence done to Buddhists. Uh, by, by the police in, in Pune, people were injured, men, women, children, injured, killed, and people coming in really depressed, really low. And Dharma Lochner, I remember asking me as we sat down, what can your Metabhavna do for this? You know, I was used to teaching the Dharma in London, you know, where you didn't get that kind of question. This was real. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to say. We, we just sat quietly. It was incredibly humbling. I'm incredibly grateful to Lokamitra for taking me to India and, uh, <clears throat> and for being there, uh, especially at the beginning, and seeing, witnessing Bhante returning to India, communicating the Dhamma in India, which brings me to my next theme, going forth in communication. Bhante was not just vividly aware of others, he was involved with others, alert to others. He was keenly responsive to others. I would say he trembled with others. He possessed, I would say, anukampa, which is often translated as compassion, but which literally means to shake with or to tremble with. And in the early 1960s, in his lecture on going for refuge, in the meaning of conversion in Buddhism, given at the Hampstead Vihara, really, really early on in his time in the West, he describes going for refuge to the Sangha as a going forth from mere contact, which is superficial, to communication, which he characterizes as a vital, mutual responsiveness, a common exploration of the spiritual world in complete honesty and harmony where the distinction between the more or less experienced loses its meaning. No one is concerned with status here. This is how spiritual transformation takes place. So I was able to witness, even be a part of, Bhante's return to India and to see how he communicated. There were those great lectures, open-air lectures, 3,000 people, 
quite small audience uh, at a Helia Ashram in Pune, central Pune. I remember hearing in Bunty expound on the future of the Sangha. And I learnt about Dr. Ambedkar in lectures like that, as Bunty commented on Dr. Babasev's vision, or criticism actually, of the Buddhist Sangha in the Buddha and the future of, of, of his religion. Uh, and Bhante noticing the resonances between Dr. Ambedkar's vision and what Bhante had done in founding uh, the order. Then that incredible lecture, I can't remember which one it is, where he launched in at the beginning of the lecture. I thought, where's he going? What's he doing? How can he do this? He launched in to a few thousand people. Many of them would have been illiterate in those days. He launched into an explanation of the yoga chara system of consciousness. <laughs> well, where are we going? Where are we going? And then, of course, when he got to the Krishto Mano Vignana, the defiled mind consciousness that sees a real self and a real other, he suddenly says, This is where caste comes from. This is where untouchability comes from, from the depths of the minds of people, at which point everybody started clapping. They thought it was an absolutely beautiful point that used to happen in Indian lectures when you made a... You knew you got people when they started clapping. Notice no... Anyway. <laughs> but there were other things, very sort of tender things. So, Okamitra and I were a bit puzzled by the conflicts within the Buddhist community, the deep resentments. And Bhante said, Look, you must understand. You must understand the Buddhist community has been at the bottom of everything. They're so oppressed. Where is that anger going to go? It can't go upwards to higher caste. They'll just be hit even harder. So of course it's going to come out among them. So he wasn't saying that we should encourage anger or resentment, but getting us to understand deeply, real compassion, understand deeply what the psychological effects of caste and untouchability were. And I remember seeing him, I saw him through an open doorway, uh, talking in Hindi. He was sitting cross-legged on a bed, and of course he had his robes on. And he was talking to Dharma Lochner, a very old uh, disciple. And he was explaining to her in beautiful, well, beautiful sounding, gentle Hindi, her sadhana, the Tara. Sadhana. I could see him doing that. And Dharma Lochner looking up with an incredible smile of uh, a grin of devotion, or well, gentle smile of, of devotion. He even had time to tease me, read my mind and gently tease me. I was sitting with him and Lokomitra one day having a cup of tea. And um, he, um, he was talking about the really good speakers in the movement. He said, well, of course, Sabut is very good. And Dharma is very good, and Nagabodhi is very good, and David Mitra is very good, and you're very good, Loka Mitra, and all these names. And I was sitting there thinking, yeah, well, what about me? <laughs> what about me? And at a certain point, he turned to me with that smile. You know that smile he had, where it, I can't really describe it, but the smile was saying, he's going to give me everything I'm asking for. He said, of course of the younger order members. Padma Vadra's quite good. <laughs> so I felt pleased, and then I realized what I'd been thinking. And oh, goodness, he's read my mind. Um, but I think my thoughts were so loud, probably anybody could have heard them. We also had a, an encounter with a politician, an old disciple of Bhante's name, Dadaseb Rupawate. He came to see me in Lokomitra. Bhante wasn't, there then, and Dada Seb uh, was, you know, he was involved in the Congress party at that time in Maharashtra. And he told Lokamitra and I what Bhante was like in the early 60s, touring a Mednagar district, which was so poor. And Dada Seb was in tears. You know, this, he was this you know, hardened politician in tears, saying, well, we, we'd not had a monk like that come to us. Bhante would sleep on the floor, sleep anywhere, he'd drink any water, eat any food, he didn't mind walking from village to village, traveling in bullet cart or on the back of somebody's bicycle. It was so moving. That, that, it's these experiences 
that, that made people want Banshee to come back, made us, that, that, that inspired people to ask us to start things again in India. Banshee had that effect, he was with them. And it's all, I would say, the expression of going forth. Living the going forth and communicating the Dharma to others, whatever their conditions, whatever their circumstances. Of course, people want these days the Dharma to reach a greater range of, and variety of people. And telling you these stories about Bhante responding to people. There's another story, I must tell it. I'm a bit worried about time, I know, but how am I doing? Oh, good, that's good. It's a relief. I've told Arya Jai that she can do what Banti did to me in a talk once when I was going on and on. And he said, you really need to finish now. <laughs> Three times before I finished. <laughs> but there's another story. I, I, was, uh, I used to gather up Banti's garlands after the big lectures or any of the lectures. I was sort of Banti's attendant in some ways and put his sandals on his feet and then we'd go through the crowds to the car to take us home and uh, I loved this. I, it was easily the best communication I ever had with Banti, just doing simple tasks. You know, I really, I, I really feel in some ways I'm in the wrong place. I, I, I you just want to be an attendant, I think. And anyway, going through the crowds and of course people were coming forward to touch Banti's feet, especially older men and older women coming forward and literally wanting to touch his feet. And I thought, well, Banty must be tired. It's been two and a half hours. He's been giving and giving. So I sort of pushed through. Banty gently but firmly put his hand on my shoulder. I'll never forget that touch. He said, you mustn't do that. It's very important for people to have this connection. And there was so much compassion in that voice. Compassion for the people, but compassion for this young fool, um, so much uh, compassion, so much tenderness. So yes, I saw Banti, these stories, are, I'm trying to get across Banti communicating to a, a wide range of people. And people want these days the Dharma to reach a greater range and variety of people. It must be for the Bahujan, the many people, which isn't just lots of people, the Bahujan is anti-caste. It this doesn't recognize any caste division, any class division or anything of that nature. The Dharma is for everyone regardless of background and circumstances. We know all that. But you do that, I think, by going forth into the Dharma, leaving behind all conditioning as much as you possibly can and entering into what the Pragna Paramita calls the Aniketa Charya living, coursing without a home. And of course, the perfection of wisdom means this not just literally, but existentially, metaphysically, in form, in feeling, will, perception and awareness. Nowhere in them the Bodhisattva finds a place to rest on. Without a home, the Bodhisattvas wander. Dharmas never hold them, nor do the Bodhisattvas grasp at those dharmas the jinnas bodhi, they are bound to gain. Which brings me to my next theme, which we could call perhaps going forth in the wilderness. And it begins with a poem written in 1967, by Banti, of course. I want to break out, batter down the door, go tramping black heather all day on the windy moor, and at night, in hayloft or under hedge, find a companion suited to my mind. I want to break through, shatter time and space, cut up the void with a knife, pitch the stars from their place, nor shrink back when, lidded with darkness, the eye of reality opens and blinds me, blue as the sky. I really love this poem of Bantis and those other, what I call ecstatic poems of Sangharakshita, uh, written in the early 60s, 70s. These 
poems written when, as he once put it, he was in the desert after he had left or had been expelled from the Rome of official organised Buddhism in Britain to rediscover the Dharma, to live the Dharma, but in an entirely different world. This, of course, was how he was so attracted to the image of St. Jerome as translator and alchemist, dredging from the depths the word, the sacred word for the people. He, too, Bhante, too, was a translator, going into the depths of the Dharma to bring it to the people in the 20th century West, to transform it, which meant living in it in a different way, experimenting with it, trying things out, is why he wrote poems about Holman Hunt's painting of the scapegoat, the scapegoat being sent into the desert to die amidst the bones with all the sins of the people upon him. But Bhante described this desert, this wilderness, as a wonderful place. The wilderness is a wonderful place where many things become clear to one. And it was because he was in this wilderness, this desert, he said it was possible to him to, for him to found the Western Buddhist order. We come out of the wilderness. It is from this wilderness that the order emerged and you can see it's forming in Bhante's poems from the late 60s through to the early 80s. You can see its emergence in the early seminars and hear it in early lectures, this profound engagement with the tradition, but in relation to the world around him, the people around him. He said of this early period that he had already realized the centrality of going for refuge, but what he realized was the need for some kind of collective embodiment of individuals coming together, placing the three jewels at the center of their lives, reorganizing their lives, transforming their lives around the act of going for refuge. And that transformation, that reorganization, leading to the disruption of normal patterns of behavior, even traditional Buddhist terms, practices, and customs, Speaking personally, I never want to lose connection with that period. It seems to me that often the most vital creative movements in Buddhist history often emerge from people regarded by conventional society as being in the margins, who reside in the liminal spaces, who are even regarded as outcast by society, who are not thought of as being proper by the standards of conventional society. The Buddha and his disciples are certainly not conventional. Many stories in the Pali Canon make that very clear. In much later Buddhism, the Tantric movement uh, emerges, at least uh, mythically, out of the Siddhas. And many of them come from the, some of the most despised and rejected parts of Indian society of its time. Shabara, the tribal, Virupa, Mr. Ugly, because he was fat and because he'd broken his monastic vows. They were not respectable people. They wandered the streets and entered the markets, singing their riddling, ecstatic songs, the Charya Giti, uh, action songs, if you like, in old Bengali, old Assamese, old Aurya, and other vernaculars, the language of the streets, often singing of the companion suited to their mind, of the spontaneous wisdom within them who is described in very ordinary language, the Shabara girl, the washer girl, the fierce lady, Sahaja Sundari, lady naturally beautiful, their elusive yet generous inspiration. They're concerned with breaking out and breaking through as the inspiration breaks out and breaks through. I think of Kunha Pada, the black siddha, singing. He strikes at existence with the arm of emptiness. He steals the stones of delusion and eats them. He is asleep. He does not know the difference between himself and others. 
The naked Kanna sleeps in the spontaneous, neither aware nor feeling he has gone full asleep and dreams in bliss that he sets all beings free. In a dream I saw the empty world spinning about, neither coming nor going. I shall make the great yogin, my friend. The scholars don't see things my way. So I used to read these songs of Kanna in pujas not long after I was ordained, when I was living at Sir Carvati, which prompted one older member to describe the pujas I led at that time as punk pujas. <laughs> it was the summer of punk at the time. Anyway, this has all been coming back to today, but the other day, sitting in my chapter meeting when we were doing our brief meditation beforehand, I had Bunty appeared above my head wearing his yellow robes with his long hair, very tanned, and his beads. Uh, it's how I like to see Bounty. He was like that when he ordained me. He was sitting very still. He was smiling. But the world I was in was Balmore Street. All those squats, this terribly squalid, run-down world. And it seemed very important. It seemed, at that moment, like a sort of tantric, urban, pure land. I'm not being nostalgic. I don't like nostalgia. I don't think there's some golden age uh, in our past that the best time is here. But I think what was going, there was a particular meaning in that sort of vision or reverie. I could just as easily have thought of my friends in the early days in India of Bodhisen with that great warm grin of his taking me by the hand to lead me through the slums of Bombay and teaching me how to communicate the Dhamma in the most abject conditions and urging me to go beyond my comforts. I remember the day I had a terrible fever. You know, it's only you can only get in India, you know, where you, you really feel you, you was delirious and dying. And that night there was a talk arranged in the sweeper colony in Bombay Central, very different community. Bodhisattva came in, said, OK, it's time to go. And I said, Bodhisattva, I'm ill. I'm dying. I can't go. And he said, and he's so crestfallen, but at Bhavavadra, we, this is special. You have, you have to come. Just, just, just come and sit. <laughs> come and sit. Just sit. I said, well, we're only going by taxi. We're not going to take the bus. You know, those buses at Rosh Hashanah in Bombay. Goodness. He said, okay, yeah, taxi, there and back. But come. And of course, once we got there and the beauty of what the community had created, the fairy lights, the shrine, the introductions, the incredible courtesies and graciousness of our hosts, I had to get up and speak. And, and you know, almost sort of lost my mind doing it, but... It was so worthwhile. And of course, Bodhi Sen, with his beaming, beaming smile, was turning my sentences into clear and direct Marathi, going straight to the heart of the people. He was the one really giving the talk. I think of huge old Shakyanant taking me from village to village, from sugar town to sugar town, from district town to district town in Kolhapur district to teach the Dharma. In his case, it wasn't teaching the Dharma, it was celebrating the Dharma. He'd warm up the audience before I came on with incredible humor, really kind of risque humor, and very down to earth language. And when we went to places, I remember one village, all the children were coming forward for blessings and giving out, he was giving out homeopathic medicine left, right, and center. And, did a naming ceremony, we'd, and we'd worked so hard to make our, our different rituals really you know, well put together, and Shakyanan invented his own with lots and lots of magic, putting a flower in a loter on the shrine and then waving the flower above the child's head and pushing the flower down on the, the, the baby's head and saying, Tumzan Alkai, what is your name? And then giving the name, and Bodhi said and I were looking at this. <laughs> But you could see what he was doing. You could see what he was doing. He was a baba, if you like, for the people. And he was communicating the Dharma to the people. 
And as far as he was concerned, this was all to do with Bantis blessing, nothing else. I remember when we walked into a village and lots of beautifully dressed women in saris came to, came to greet us. And we were about to go forward. Shakyanan stopped me and said, Pabhavadra, wait. This is all for Bhante. Bhante has made this. Yes, Shakyanan, Bhante's made this. I think of old Sangha Sen in another part of Maharashtra, another old man, these were old family men, Sangha Sen, demanding to know from me what Bhante meant when he said that in the tantric Sangha, the Vajrakula, what did Bhante mean when he said that everyone in that Sangha is naked? Because <laughs> nakedness is, you know, it's one of those slightly touchy areas in India, isn't it? Um, I explained as best I could about truth and honesty and reality and Vajra and authenticity and all that. Weeks later, on a retreat, he proudly showed me his, a handbill he'd had printed in Marathi announcing a retreat he was going to lead uh, for the people he'd encountered in all the villages and towns of Vidarbha in the east of Maharashtra, because that's how he lived wandering from place to place to bring the Dhamma to the people. The title of the retreat on the handbill, which he was so proud of, was How to Be Naked. <laughs> which, of course, would have been a very provocative title for a Dhamma retreat in India at that time. So I, I, I'm not remember, as I say, I remember these times not nostalgically, the best time is always this time. I think these memories are arising because we live in a time of so much regulation, of so much institutionalization, organization, and politicization. Sometimes it seems to me that the weight of the world with its constricting ideologies has never been more with us. And sometimes I must confess to wondering if some of our own organisational structures and discussions are drifting into restricting the liberating flow of the Dhamma. Not that I'm against organisation or even institutions, not at all. Padmasambhava celebrated conversion of the Tibetan gods was to establish an institution, Samye, a place, an environment, a supportive structure for spiritual practice, a focus for the people. And I only have to consider the incredible organization that has created this convention and the hard work and dedication of people that has created it. And I have endless, boundless gratitude for the people who take organizational responsibility in our order and movement that I benefit from. But the organization, the institution must serve the flow of Kalyanamitrata, even the ecstatic flow of Kalyanamitrata, which is so evident here. This is a beautiful point that Sabuti made many, many years ago, that our, whatever structures we have are there to support the flow of Kalyanamitrata. Do our structures support or hinder the flow of genuine, inspirational, spiritual friendship, the transmission of the Dharma itself, or are they becoming stultifying and not really serving that flow? We must resist the inertia that can so easily adhere to structure. We must break out of it, go forth from it, and open ourselves to the inspiration of anti-structure, even in the midst of structure. Bunty did not feel bound by given structures to live and practice the Dharma. Buddha Dasa told me, when I was first living with him in 74 or 75, that Bhante had once said to him that if the Buddha was alive now, the 1970s, he wouldn't be wearing robes, he'd wear a t-shirt and jeans. Even such a comment is not as untraditional as you might think. Don't forget the Buddha telling Ananda that he could enter seven different assemblies, warriors, Brahmins, householders, shramanas, devas of the four great kings, devas of the 33, 
assemblies of Maras and Brahmas, and before he sat down with them, he adopted their appearance and their speech, whatever it might be, and he would instruct, inspire, fire and delight with them with a discourse on Dhamma. And they just did not know whether he was a god or a man, and then he would just disappear. And they wondered, who was that? If you want to follow, nearly finished, very nearly. Uh, very nearly. Because now it's time for me to disappear um, and deconstruct this talk. So the final section is called Going Forth, Gnana, Perfume and Love. In his reflections on going forth given here in 1997, Bhante ends by speaking of going forth from Manas, or defiled mind consciousness, to Arya Gnana, or noble wisdom, or, yes, non-dual wisdom. He didn't say so much about that, uh, and I'm going to include with a pretty hopeless attempt at indicating one place where that going forth may be found. In his room at Adistana, on his side table, I noticed to my intense delight that Bhante had there small bottles of Indian atar, small bottles of perfume, because Bhante loved sweet perfumes. I remember him telling me about the incense parties of the 60s and how they were quite trippy. In his memoirs, Bunty mentions a, well, a Wessack celebration. Uh, the chapter is titled the, the Scent of Gardenias because the people of Kalimpong were just bringing bunches and bunches of these very sweet-smelling uh, cream-coloured flowers. And Bunty just delights in decorating the shrine and the whole place with these, with these gardenias. And towards the end of that section, he spoke about perfume and the awakening of faith in the Mahayana, a text of great significance to him. Uh, in his old diary leaves, he, he said that uh, Red Ashvagosha's awakening of faith in the Mahayana, I think no other Buddhist book so completely expresses my own deepest intuitions as this matchless treatise reflected on Ashvagosha's philosophy, deep meditation. And in his memoirs, and later on in a lecture called The Mystery of Human Communication, Bhante says this about, uh, about, about one particular section of the awakening of faith. I was particularly struck by the concept, or rather image, of perfuming, distant reflections of which even found their way into my poetry. In early Buddhism, Sangsara and Nirvana were mutually exclusive realities, which left unresolved the question of how they were related. According to Ashvagosha, or whoever wrote under that name, the relation between them was one of mutual perfuming. Clothes have no scent in themselves, but if they are permeated with perfumes, then they come to have a scent. Similarly, the pure state of suchness is without defilement, but upon its being perfumed by ignorance, there appear on it the marks of defilement. In a corresponding manner, the defiled state of ignorance is defied, devoid of any purifying influence, but upon its being perfumed by suchness, it comes to have such an influence. Indispensable though the help of the Buddhas, Bodhisattvas and spiritual friends may also be, a person is able to renounce samsara and realize nirvana primarily because his deluded mind is permeated by the perfume of suchness, a perfume far surpassing the scent of gardenias. Perhaps going forth from Manas to Arya Gnana are in those moments, those places, when we smell the fragrance of the unseen realm in this realm, when we sense the fragrant particles of wisdom and compassion in the midst of samsara, perhaps in the most powerful of all that drives us and makes samsara in desire, passion, craving, 
thirst itself, loba, chanda, raga, prema, trishna. In the 1950s, Bhante speaks of not destroying desire. For if the seed is destroyed, where are the flowers that you would consecrate? What will you offer up? What will be transformed? And if you do not have those consecrated flowers to offer, that means that you don't know the great mystery of the void. Shunyata for Bhante in his early writings seemed to me like a kind of magical transforming force or dimension like the alchemists Quicksilver or Alembic, certainly nothing one-sidedly intellectual and definitely not nihilistic. And between 1950 and 1953, Bounty wrote that long poem, The Veil of Stars, stylistically inspired by Rabindranath Tagore's Stray Birds. Tagore himself being inspired by those wandering, singing, ecstatic, Sufi tantric minstrels, the Bells of Bengal. And as I'm sure you know, this poem charts the journey of love. It charts the, go charts the going forth from desire for anyone into love for someone, into compassion for everyone. This journey is in a realm of heightened emotion. It travels through image and emotion and mood, through the beauty of the Himalayas, through glowworms and stars in the vastness of the Himalayan sky, of not knowing where the glowworms of earth end and where the stars begin. It happens in a realm where boundaries are blurring and even dissolving. Towards the end, Bounty writes of knowing that she, he shall always see your face shining down on him from the innermost depths of heaven. It's not clear whether this is the earthly beloved or the bodhisattva, or indeed, if that distinction really obtains in this realm of mutual perfuming. It's a going forth, this poem perhaps from Sangsara and Nirvana from all categories. So I'm going to end. I really am going to end. Yeah, I really am going to end with a few verses. Shall I disdain to hold a glowworm in my hand simply because a wreath of stars has been placed upon my head? Better a glowworm if it guides you along the homeward path than a star that leads you astray. When the horizon is shrouded in darkness, I cannot tell where end the glowworms of earth and where begin the stars of heaven. Desire for anyone flowers into love for someone and at last bears fruit as compassion for everyone. The tear of the Bodhisattva's compassion flows through the world as love even as the austere snows of the Himalayas flow in rivers down into the green plains. It is the smile of the Bodhisattva that flashes upon me from the heart of the golden sunset and the flood of his compassion that inundates my soul with streams of love. Reality is reflected in my heart as love. And this love of mine is in turn mirrored in the all-embracing bosom of reality, as though the moon lay reflected in the depths of the ocean and the ocean in the calm, clear heart of the moon. I know that even from the inmost depths of heaven, I shall, I shall see your face shining out upon me above the utmost beauty of the stars. The secret of love is love. Let the silence speak. <laughs>